All right, buddy. So welcome to the show. And uh, I got to tell you, today is one of those days where it makes me quite happy that uh, we have been dollar cost averaging and doing a lot of the hard work as everything happens in the background. And of course, what I'm talking about, if you have not checked your portfolio, which I highly doubt that you have not, quite a big green day today. And it uh, looks like we've got, uh, I think Bitcoin almost hit 32, Ethereum up above. And there's been some, uh, some major, major moves. And uh, some of the big ones, of course, being alts. Uh, we got Solana at 26% for seven days. Uh, Toncoin, almost 12%. One of my favorites, Chainlink, 37. Of course, there's a ton of different ones to go over. And uh, that is just uh, what is happening for the market itself. The question then has to be asked is, why is this all happening right now? So the good thing to do is take a look at, is this a fake pump? Is this just something that uh, is a flash in the pan? So the first thing we want to do is just take a look at, well, some of the most interesting or easy stuff to take a look at, which would be volume. And we take a look at volume. We can see right here that uh, today it is the 23rd. Let me blow this up real quick. And uh, yesterday, let me see here, October 23rd, 47 billion, 147 million, 792,000. Not too bad. And we see that uh, the volume itself is doing pretty good. So if we take a look at this, it's not just uh, a little bit of people moving the market. There is more out there. However, this, this pales in comparison. If we take a look back into March when we had 85 billion, and then moving back, uh, looking into July 68, moving back into November 7th, 2021, those were good days, 92 billion. But all in all, the volume is not weak and it looks pretty good. So what does this mean for the bears. And unfortunately, uh, for every winner, there is a loser. And uh, we should not celebrate too hard. But yeah, unfortunately, uh, the shorts in the last 24 hours uh, have been liquidated to the tune of $132 million. So that is just one of those things that happens. And that's the market itself. Again, the question would be why. And really, it comes down to a lot of things that are going on behind the scenes. And one of those things being BlackRock buying Bitcoin. And of course, this spot ETF. Now, you all know my position on this. But uh, Things have been changing. So what I want to do is have you take a listen to this. This is, of course, Hester Pierce, one of the uh, commissioners at the SEC. I'm not going to play the full eight minutes because uh, I linked that in the description. You can take a listen. But uh, what she says here in the first 30 to 45 seconds is quite telling. And uh, let me pull this up so you can actually hear the entire thing. Just take a listen to this. Commissioners. Good morning to you. Uh, love to get your sense of where you think uh, the state of some of these regulations around crypto really stand right now. There's been so much speculation, even in the past several weeks, about where uh, a Bitcoin ETF uh, might land. There was a, a moment, as you, uh, I'm sure, recall, where uh, a report came out erroneously, apparently, uh, that one would be approved. That would be the, the BlackRock uh, one. But a view that, given some of the things that have happened in court recently with the SEC losing, uh, that maybe the SEC is now more open uh, to approving one of these types of uh, funds. Is it? Well, good morning, Andrew. And I can't, I can't say whether or not the, the commission is, is ready to approve a Bitcoin exchange traded product. I've been thinking we should approve one for the last five years. That's it. That's all I'm going to play. Because if you listen to the entire interview, you will understand why... Hester really hasn't got things moving because she doesn't really give too much away. So when she's talking about this information, I thought it was just most telling when she said that it was surprising that they haven't a, uh, actually accepted a spot Bitcoin ETF for five years, which I have to say, I have to agree with her. And the rest of the stuff, it was interesting. But uh, of course, you can watch the whole clip. It's about eight minutes, links in the description. But I think that first part was the most telling. So from that piece, again, what's happening behind the scenes? Well, uh, as of today, the SEC was ordered to review Grayscale's Bitcoin ETF application. Now, this comes as no surprise because the SEC did not appeal the decision for the court case, which would have allowed uh, Grayscale to turn over their, their fund into an actual spot Bitcoin ETF. And uh, it looks like the court is saying, yes, the SEC has to review it, but not so fast. Here's what the court was saying. In accordance with the judgment of August 29th, this constitutes the formal mandate of this court. Wrote the Court of Appeals clerk, Mark Landry, in a Monday filing. 
While the SEC still has the power to deny the application, it would need to find a new reason for doing so, not related to its prior justification. So just because the SEC has to come in and say, okay, now we're gonna actually take a look at it again, they can still knock it down. However, the chances of that are actually uh, becoming less and less. This is an article, uh, October 16th, the Bitcoin ETF is a near certainty by January. And this is from uh, crypto analyst Gnomes at Bloomberg given 90% odds that a product will debut by January 10th. Not at the very last piece, because the last final deadline would be March 12th, March 13th, correct me in the comment section. But the second to last would be around January. So hopefully by next year, we'll get one going. This was also registered as far as a ticker for iShares, the BlackRock ETF. It's going to be under the iShares Bitcoin TRSH ACE. Listen on the ticker IBTC. So they already got that going. And then the Coupe de Gras what everybody's been talking about today. Uh, BlackRock has formally announced that it plans to seed its spot Bitcoin ETF in October. So you have to remember that in a spot ETF, it's a lot different than a futures ETF. Futures ETF, you don't have to really buy anything. It's just paper. Paper Bitcoin, paper products, paper commodities. It's just a futures product. However, with a spot, you have to buy the underlying asset and hold that underlying asset. And that's why BlackRock has teamed up with Coinbase to hold the underlying asset, which would be Coin, which of course would be Coinbase. But they have to actually buy it. And they've actually made this statement. So information was discovered by Scott Johnson, an investor at Von Buren Capital, who also knows that BlackRock has obtained a CUS, CUSIP number for the ETF. A, a CUSIP number serves as a unique identifier for securities. Seeding an ETF happens when initial funding is provided typically by a bank or broker dealer. Used to purchase a few creation units, that would be Bitcoin, in exchange for ETF shares, which can be traded in an open market on day one. So it looks like BlackRock is feeling pretty confident this is going to happen, so much so that they went ahead and bought Bitcoin. I think this is one of those reasons why the market is uh, jumping. It is a green day. And I gotta tell you, this is one of those days when I'm actually happy that I've been doing some dollar cost averaging and going forward. Now, I need to remind everybody, this is important. Just because today is a green day doesn't mean that green days last forever. Tomorrow could be World War III. Or Bitcoin could become the world reserve currency. Who really knows? So just be careful what you do out there. Maybe if you are so inclined, take profits. It kind of lines up with what we're talking about as far as the rules. Never invest more than you can afford to lose. It's all gone. Everything's a scam until proven otherwise. Don't leave anything on exchanges. Take it all off. Use a tangent wallet, cold storage device. Don't use leverage. Uh, two, to three, two to three X is not so bad. And take profits along the way. And that's all we have. So let me know what you think about that in the comment section. That will conclude the part for the news. Now, Bitcoin's great. Traditional crypto and digital assets are great. But what about the things that are going on in Web3? And with Web3, it's a kind of a, it's not a difficult com concept to understand, but it's important that we get people in here who understand it better than me. So to that end, uh, I've had Yatsu, who is uh, the founder of Animoca Brands, and he laid down exactly what Web3 actually is, made it very simple. I linked this video also in the description. You can check it out so you can understand a little bit better. So today, what I want to do is I wanted to bring on Robert Braggs. He is from Token Gamer and also uh, Metamona from the Metamona Show. And what I want to talk about a couple of things is why the metaverse is important, Web3 and all that great stuff, and then also to take a look at the other side from Yuga Labs. So... Without further ado, let me introduce you to uh, two friends of mine. That would be Rob Braggs and Mona. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. Thanks for stopping by. Hi, guys. Hello. Yes, thank you, guys. So, guys, I'll be honest with you. By the way, Rob, sorry to say this, but uh, yeah. Rob number one, Rob number two, before we get it mixed up, nah, I just yes. want to say, Rob number two, did you hear he just puts us in the same category as Yatsu? Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, that, is, that is very generous. <laughs> yes, I don't know if you guys have everything on your belt like yet, Sue, but I know you guys are just as knowledgeable to bring us the great information about what's going on in the metaverse and Web3. So I appreciate it because I find it very hard to keep up with all this stuff. So thank you for stopping by. So, oh, the, yes, so the, yes, yes, yes. So the first question is, um, let's start with this because... Let's start with, with Rob, number one, and uh, go from Rob to talk about Yuga Labs on the other side. And then Mona, I'd like to get to you to talk about, actually, no, 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 let me rephrase that. Let's do this first. Mona, I want to oh, start with I'm you. I'm going first, huh? Okay. Yeah, I want you to go first because it's important that you set up why the metaverse is important. Because 
When Facebook changed it to Meta, I thought that was it. That's gonna be the greatest thing. And we saw the most ridiculous thing that Meta ever put out for their, for their metaverse. It looked ridiculous. However, just recently, he was on a podcast and it looked fantastic. Um, so talk to us about why the metaverse is important and why it's going to dominate moving forward. You know, first, let me say this, that uh, as a journalist, when I came to the dark side, this side, yeah. I personally decided for myself after reading a lot of white papers that I wanted to lean more into uh, metaverse and gaming because I saw the space as a lower barrier to entry for the mainstream audience. I saw a lot of relatability for the mainstream audience and I thought uh, the mainstream will have an easier time. It's more palatable for them uh, to come from this direction to accept some of the features that Web3 uh, offers. Now, having that said, uh, you know, it's rough. It's been it's been very rough. This is all very correlated with crypto and the sentiment and where we are today. And we had to get rid of a lot of bad actors. Um, and, you know, you brought up Meta, big tech like Meta. And, and this is, again, my opinion. But I think big tech uh, like Meta gave uh, Metaverse a bad name uh, when it pushed its janky vision to uh, the masses and said, this is something brand new. Well, this is not something brand new. I think Rob would agree with me that World of War Warcraft is a metaverse and is not new. Fortnite is a metaverse and is not new. And they're all evolving, right? Sure, Horizon World is suffering from low user base. I don't know what Horizon World is doing, but I can tell you that open online virtual worlds are evolving. Yes, the DAUs are down, uh, but devs are up. And that's our saying right now. And a lot is happening behind uh, in the backgrounds and in the foregrounds. And I think, you know, and I say I'm going to speak for Rob here as well. We are in the trenches and we are seeing what projects are doing now. We're not saying that every project is going to make it. But what I can tell you is that uh, the substantial projects are really uh, thinking about creating these digital uh, immersive worlds, and they're inevitable because this next iteration is being built for the generation that's coming behind us, and you go and they want to be in these environments. So, uh, metaverse is an inevitable, inevitable. I will say that. Yeah, and uh, it's interesting because, like, I got to tell you, before I took a look at it was Lex Friedman. I, I always stumble on his name. Before I I saw this interview. Uh, with Lex, and it's him and Mark Zuckerberg going back and forth. This is them in their metaverse. This is them. They have the goggles on. You can't really see it right here. But I was thinking to myself, I'm like, if this is how it looks now, and this is only like after, what, 12 months, 14 months of, of work moving forward, what is it going to look like later on? And then, of course, like you talked about Fortnite. So these types of, like, I know people on my channel, we kind of think of ourselves like Web3 and Fortnite. That doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. Remember, Fortnite was the first free-to-play game to hit a billion dollars in uh, under a year. So uh, as we move forward and we have these other types of, of aspects of going from Web2 to Web3, I think it could be a very big play. So. Well, I mean, and we have come a very, very long way from uh, uh, what is it? Torso down, non-existent avatars, right? <laughs> and I think <laughs> we really have. Uh, so we're gonna we have to give uh, Mark that credit. Um, but I think Rob would agree with me too that now, and I think I read in the audience uh, comments as well. It really at this point with gaming comes down to a compelling IP. If you don't have a compelling IP, uh, the technology is not selling it. Right. So at the end of the day, you still have to have a compelling IP for people to be attracted to it and want to virally share it. And I, and I know Rob is going to have a lot to say on that. Well, that would be perfect. That would lead us to our next point. So, uh, Rob, Mr. Briggs, let's talk yep. about this new piece that you, we've got here. Well, first of all, you guys can uh, you can find Robert Braggs and uh, his uh, YouTube, also Twitter and everything else. Links in the description. Uh, Mona show here and Twitter also in the description as well. But uh, Robert, you got this um, a website, Token Gamer, which mm -hmm. is pretty good if you can't watch everything. And you've been featuring this. This is from Yuga Labs called The Other Side. This is another yeah. metaverse play, right? It is. It's, um, so it's a metaverse project that was perhaps a little blurry um, in the early stages when they first announced it. Um, I wasn't sure if it was just an extension of their success with Bored Ape Yacht Club and... 
it didn't feel like it had much flesh on the bones. However, it has started to make real end roads with what they're doing. And the foundation of that is technology. They are investing heavily. Well, they're investing heavily in two areas. They're investing in hiring, which I think is fundamental. I mean, you can't build something that's going to change gaming forever, change the online experience forever, uh, and not have a highly experienced team. The end of 2022, they hired um, Daniel Allegra, who is the ex-president and COO of Activision Blizzard. Blizzard He's now right. CEO um, at Yuga Labs. They also announced um, a couple of years ago or last year, perhaps, Mike Seavers, who worked at Riot Games and Epic Games. He's now CTO. Ah. And they've, they've started investing in... They, they invested in a few different tech companies. So one of the problems that... I've seen with the metaverse, and I think we've all seen whether we realized it or not, is you couldn't have enough concurrent players in the same digital online space to make it feel like a city, to make it feel like a stadium, to make it right. feel like anything meaningful. Um, you can flesh it out with NFTs, uh, sorry, NPCs, but I mean, who, who cares? It's just pointless. Uh, it, it doesn't add anything. So what they've done is they've invested in a company called Hadian, who is working on that exact problem, a scaling issue. And they did, uh, as you can see right there on the screen right now, um, second trip, which was a technical test. And they had 7,200 concurrent players in the same space, which if you're not a gamer, that perhaps isn't that impressive. If you are a gamer, you'll know that is absurd. Like mm. it doesn't happen, particularly in the 3D world. Um, so these sort of moves, I, I think a lot of what people imagine the metaverse to be or what it can be, is gated by technology. And why I th I'm, I would put some of my eggs in the uh, other side basket is because they are investing in exactly the technological limitations that we need to overcome. Excellent. You know what? This, this they, um, Go ahead, Mona. No, sorry. No, I just wanted to write on what Rob said. Uh, Rob, they also uh, bought Roar Studios, correct? And I think with that collaboration, they are hiring a ton of AI engineering positions. Do you know what, uh, where they're incorporating AI? I was uh, looking into that, mm. reading into that. I don't, not off the top of my head, no. But I mean, every good company at the moment has to try and find a way of integrating AI into their workflow and uh, yeah, it doesn't surprise me, but I don't know exactly what areas of AI they're implementing. Yeah, so, yeah, I think everything has to, I mean, we saw a couple of games that uh, were coming out that uh, were using AI and they were really just prowling, plowing forward. I think it's going to be one of those things that you have to actually do. But Robert, just to get to your point about the 7,200 NPCs or seven, excuse me, 7,200 players that are out there. I remember there was a study that was done I want to say it was the sandbox, one of the early metaverse plays. And they found out that out of all the plays, all the people that all the hype that was there, it was under like 100 different people at any one particular time. So for you yeah. to say that there's 7,200. I think that was Decentraland. This, that's what it was, Decentraland, Decentral. the other one. Yeah. Pretty awful. So when I read something like that, I'm like, this, is, this might not be so great. So now we're talking about 7,200 and moving forward. Oh, it sounds pretty good. How about this? Because a lot of people are asking, there. I see some things in the chat. So like, okay, metaverse is great and that's fantastic. So what is the play here? What is the play here? Is it for is it for the immersive experience? Is it for to move things forward? Is it to invest or is it all of the above? Or what do you guys see it as? I mean, I'll, I'll take on that. I I'm a, you know I'm a journalist, so I'm not a gamer, and I'm I'm, I'm not here for gaming, but. Metaverse does start in gaming, right? And the future is moving toward uh, digital experiences in immersive worlds, right? But there's this misperception that Metaverse is going to replace our interactions. That's never been the case. No project, no founder is uh, preaching that. The Metaverse and I think, you know, Rob and I were talking about this uh, earlier. We need to change our terminology. People don't like the word metaverse. They don't like NFTs. They don't like crypto. So from this moment forward, I'm going to refer to the metaverse as a digital environment. Okay. The digital environment is going to be the 
is not going to replace your experiences, is not going to replace your world, is going to be an extension or enhancement to your experiences, right? Digital environments are going to add, look at it as another layer on top of reality and not the reality itself, right? And, the, and at the core of, of this digital environment, there will be culture and experiences, right? There are so many opportunities for immersive world that are not gaming. I can name one, fashion. Let's talk let's, just for a second, fashion. There is in-world shopping. You're already doing it with Amazon, right? There's smart wearables that we could have a whole session on smart wearables. There's portable experiences, brand activations. Then we have events. We have concerts, fashion shows. Then we have sports. Then we have education. Then we have training. And yes, there are problems. We have technological problems. And I think Rob um, focuses sometimes on, on those topics and Rob, feel free to interrupt me with what are some of the problems right now. I know we have VR limitations. We have scaling that Rob was mentioning. We have interoperability, which, by the way, in the past two years, I've seen significant interoperability advancements. Uh, we still have digital identity risk management that needs to be mitigated, but the solutions are on the way, right? We're seeing uh, pushing these technological boundaries. We're seeing uh, creator elements being added. So they're bringing Snoop Dogg and Tony Hawks and Paris Hilton and different mm -hmm. artists to create uh, these experiences. And we're seeing major IP brand partnership. We're seeing Marvel, Disney, Nike, Adidas, uh, McDonald's. They're all coming in and they're uh, getting their feet wet. So that's how I look at it, Rob. Um, I mean, I, I obviously I agree with um, almost all of that. And I would say I want to take one step back. So a lot of people want to um, know why why there should be any interest in the metaverse. But I think that the metaverse coming to fruition is just a natural, logical flow to how life has, has been evolving. We've you used to send a letter. Now you send an email. You used to buy your newspaper. Now you read a website. Like we now do a lot of meetings through video calls. I'm streaming this right now rather than being on stage. This every part of our life is now influenced by digital because it's easier um and we're moving more and more to that and i think one of the most important points mona made there was um when it comes to replacing the physical activity the metaverse won't necessarily replace anything it it can augment our life as it happens right now and um, when you look at sports one of the most exciting things that's happening that would be parenthetically linked to the metaverse it could be a key part of the metaverse is digital events we've seen Fortnite putting on like concerts um we we're seeing technology at the moment where you can be in a sports stadium watching a live game but in vr as if you're sitting in that stadium and i had, i told this to a friend i said how amazing would this be if you know you could watch whatever game you wanted as if you're really there you're sitting in the stadium you're watching the game and he said why would i want to do that instead of going to the game I said, well, that completely misses the point. If you could go to the game, you go to the game. But for example, Tottenham Hotspur played tonight. That's my football team, soccer team. Um, they played tonight. They have 10 plus million fans globally, maybe far more than that. I don't know. The stadium only holds 60,000 people. So think how many people globally cannot get to that game. Even if they could get to the game, they probably can't get a ticket. Yeah. Um, this allows for people to watch that thing. And, and that's just one element. I mean, fashion, shopping, we're, we're seeing all these different elements. Just more of modern life is becoming digital. It's enabling us to do more, see more, be in more places. Um, and it's, for me, it's just a logical extension of how the digital world has been evolving. Yeah, and I got Guys, I went to, I have to, Rob, I have to tell you guys this. Uh, for the first time ever, and I cannot believe I'm saying this because I feel like a 12 year old when I say this. I went to a digital nightclub last week in the Central Land and I took salsa lessons with mm. and I had to buy a wearable because I felt like I was underdressed. <laughs> hmm. well, I, I mean, mean and I had so much fun. I, you know, they gave me the coordinates. They're like, meet yeah. us at 
negative 100, negative 100. I show up. I'm like, wow, there are hundreds of people here. It's a nightclub. There's a real DJ. He's playing salsa and they're doing salsa lessons. And I'm looking around. I'm like, wow, I am so underdressed. These people are, they're taking digital wearables so seriously. And I had so much fun. I don't, I don't know how to explain it to you guys, but it's just, it's something different. It's something different that we're slowly getting used to. Maybe it's maybe it's you had so much fun because like when you go to like a lesson of anything or you're in a public uh, environment, you always have that feeling of like, you know, people are watching me and I'm here, especially people with like social anxiety. I think some of those people would want to do that, but they can't do that and they miss out on different experiences. So maybe that would be like one of those things to get around it. For me, when I take a look at the metaverse, like the stuff that we said, like, that eh, sounds good. I'd rather go to a live game, but if I can't, well, I, you know, do that other option. But the other thing that I think is, is pretty great about it is like, just like we, we take a look here, like I would really like to, you know, hang out with my grandson a lot more and I can't do that uh, as I travel and I move around. So if I have something like this, when they're actually here, imagine the people that you could put back into your life. And I think that's one of those things like uh, when you're there and you're like, you're, you're seeing them, it's a lot different than talking on the phone or texting. That's for sure. I think the connections are one of those things. So, uh, that could be one of those one of those uh, yeah. ideas to use. There's there's an interesting point there. So um, during COVID, where the UK was locked down, and I was living on my own at that point, um, so I didn't see anyone for like three months. So my lifeblood was Zoom meetings and calls with family and friends and, and colleagues and so on. Um, but I couldn't quite shake the feeling that it wasn't. It just wasn't scratching the itch. Um, mm -hmm quite as much as I wanted it to. And some people did, uh, quite a few different universities did research into this. And they found that Zoom meetings, because there's an almost imperceptible delay in saying something and the person reacting and responding and their micro expressions changing, right. you weren't getting the human connection that you usually get in person. And I think that it's probably a multifaceted problem. It's probably not just the delay. There's probably many factors and moving i mean the the lex and um mark interview that does feel like one step closer to a more fulfilling social interaction online i think at the moment we're, we're kind of primitive in the way that our digital interactions happen um so i i do think that will be a very interesting path